Among the thousands of military men in recent times who lost their lives while in the service of their country, the circumstances surrounding Captain Mantell's death are indeed extraordinary. This experienced military pilot who'd flown in the invasion in Normandy in numerous missions over the Rhine under heavy attack would take with him to his death perhaps the closest glimpse of what was thought to be a UFO. The date is January the 7th, 1948. The time is 2 o'clock in the afternoon here at the Gardman Air Force Base, just outside of Louisville, Kentucky. A Kentucky state policeman calls in to report what he has sighted. It's, it's an unusual aircraft, circular in appearance, uh, approximately 250 to uh, 300 feet in diameter. I'd say it's moving westwardly at a pretty good clip. Any information? Negative. I will check with our commanding officer. Instructions were given to contact nearby Wright-Patterson Air Base to see if they had any experimental aircraft up in that area. Flight test. We have no experimental aircraft in the area. The reports still continued to come in from adjoining towns. At 1.45 p.m., it happens. It's very white and looks like an umbrella. I don't know what it is. Through the binocs, it appears to have a red border at the bottom at times and a red border at the top at times. At approximately 2.30 p.m., a flight of Air Force P-51s come into view. The base commander decides to contact the flight leader, Captain Mantell. This is Godman, base commander. Roger, Godman Tower. This is NG-869, flight leader. Over. NG-869 from Godman Tower. We have an object out south of Godman here that we were unable to identify. We'd like you to take a look for it. Roger, I will take a look for you if you give me the correct reading. Mantell moves ahead of its wingman. The tower advises the flight leader to correct his course five degrees to the left to 210 degrees from Godman Tower. Godman Tower, this is Flight Leader NG-869, Captain Mantell. Object traveling at half my speed and directly ahead of me and above, and I'm closing in to take a good look. Can you give us a description? It appears metallic and, and to be of tremendous size. I'm going to 20,000 feet. The other pilots level off under 15,000 feet and start down. At approximately 3.15 p.m., Godman Tower loses sight of the UFO. Five minutes later, the report came in that Captain Mantell's plane had crashed. He was found dead. His watch had stopped at 3.10 p.m. that afternoon. What was it that caused this experienced pilot to become intrigued with an object that he would unwittingly give his life pursuing? Six months later, a cylindrical-shaped object giving off a phosphorescent glow was to be sighted in the night sky over Robbins Air Force Base in Georgia. At 2.45 a.m., Captain C.S. Childs and First Officer J.B. Whitted were piloting a routine Eastern Airlines flight number 576 from Houston to Atlanta. When Whitted reports, we sighted an object coming toward us. This strange object had a stream of red fire coming from its tail. And I could see it was much larger than anything I had seen or read about. Childs then notices that the object had no wings supporting it. It passed us on the right side. Its speed was about 700 miles per hour. And both men get a very good look at this unusual object. It was about 100 feet long, shaped like a cigar. As it passed, they clearly saw two rows of windows, an upper and lower, that were large and square. During that evening, there was a third witness the one passenger who was awake on that Eastern Airlines flight, Clarence McKelvey. I was startled, frightened. A male steward came to me and said, I notice you've been looking out the window. Will you talk to the pilot? And I said, well, of course. The pilot came down with his clipboard. He was visibly shaken. He told me that he had been a flyer in the war and had covered so many million miles of flight and had never seen anything like this before. What was it that I saw? Well, I saw this object, it was cigar shaped. It had a row of windows. Behind them, it was lit. Out of the rear was a cherry red flame. This hair-raising experience was witnessed by three aircraft, a passenger, and ground observers added more corroboration. 
The conclusion of an air intelligence report was that the object remains unidentified as to origin, construction, and power source, and goes into the record classified as unknown. This is the Pentagon, Washington, D.C. And this man is Colonel Bill Coleman. He was Chief of Public Information for the United States Air Force from 1969 to 1974. It was here at the Pentagon that the Defense Department first became interested in the UFO phenomenon. This occurred in the late 1940s, with reports about objects and lights seen in the sky by military personnel and others. The Air Force decided to investigate the matter anyway. There was that one possibility that these flying objects could well be foreign weapons used for test purposes and might affect our national security. The investigative branch was called Project Sign. The project had only been underway for about two weeks when the Mantel crash had made headlines across the nation. The staff's investigation was far from complete, but public pressure was enormous. And they were forced to come up with an answer to really quiet growing speculation that Mantell had been killed by hostile aliens and some flying saucer. That's when we decided that Mantell had chased the planet Venus. However, this was an initial finding. The Chills and Whitted case had an impact on the Air Force project. It presented the first close-up account by highly reliable witnesses. The object described led some of the staff to postulate an extraterrestrial theory. And they wrote up an estimate of the situation, which at the time was classified top secret, suggesting that the saucers were from outer space. This theory was rejected by the Air Force Chief of Staff, General Hoyt Vandenberg, and even other Project Science staff members as not having enough proof. So the extraterrestrial visitation idea was dropped for the time being. It's been said in jest that if these UFOs are from other worlds and they wanted it to be known, all they'd have to do is land on the White House lawn. But an incredible incident too quickly forgotten in time took place over our capital. In 1952, Air Force spokesman for the Pentagon and UFOs at that time, Mr. Al Chop, relates the famous incident that stirred the capital, causing a request from even President Truman to be kept up to date on all the details. There were radar reports of unidentified flying objects over the nation's capital. We had three reports. One came from Andrews Air Force Base radar control room, and two from the radar controls at Washington National Airport. The first sightings consisted of a number of unidentified targets picked up on radar. Then a call was placed from National to the Andrews Air Force Base flight controllers. They were apparently tracking the same targets. Then Andrews reported a visual observation of three objects that were apparently in the same position as those indicated by our radar sets. The target stayed on radar until about 12.30 a.m. They moved slowly at first, about 100 to 200 miles per hour. Then one of the targets sped away at a fantastic rate of speed. It moved west from Andrews toward Riverdale. The estimated speed was 7,300 miles per hour. At this time in the tower, we had about seven targets on the radar scope. These unidentified objects were flying all over the city. They even violated the restricted air corridors here over the White House and over the Capitol building. The phenomena wasn't to subside. The following Saturday night, July 26th, a repeat performance unsettles the Capitol again. I was awakened the following Saturday night around midnight by a telephone call to my home in Virginia. It was the public information officer for the Federal Aviation Authority. He told me the air traffic control radars were again picking up a large number of UFOs over the Capitol area. First, they would follow a definite flight path and then they would suddenly disappear. Others would come into view just as suddenly. I placed the phone call to the command post in the Pentagon, and I asked for an intercept. About 2.40 a.m., we got a radio call from a flight of F-94s, two aircraft in the flight. They also, at about that moment, appeared on our scope. 
And at that moment, a very frightening thing happened to us. All of our unknown traffic completely disappeared the moment those aircraft came on the scope. The flight leader called in and said, well, it doesn't look like we're going to do any good here, so we're going to go back to base. And at the very moment those aircraft disappeared, all of our unknown traffic appeared again on our scope. And again, it was a very frightening experience. We called Andrews Air Force Base, and they reported exactly the same thing happened to their scope. At 10 a.m. on the morning after the sighting, General Landry, at the request of President Truman, called intelligence to find out what was happening over Washington. It was the largest and longest press conference held in the Pentagon since World War II. General Samford headed the conference and said that he was personally satisfied that the radar scope sightings were the result of temperature inversions, which are known and account for certain blips on radar. Although this was the conclusion of the Air Force investigations, interestingly enough, the actual report begins with this opening comment. A study of the various reports regarding the subject. Radar sightings do not allow a positive and final explanation to be made. The CIA now would enter the picture by convening a panel of top scientists to examine the UFO phenomenon. The CIA's concern was that recent waves of sightings might constitute a threat to our national security. The thinking was that the enemy could exploit UFOs as a decoy in the preparation for an attack on the United States. Five outstanding scientists and various Air Force and CIA representatives were to meet on Wednesday, January 14th, 1953. Among the panel members was one associate member who was destined to have more experience with the UFO phenomena than any other American scientist to date, Dr. J. Allen Hynek, astrophysicist and head of the astronomy department of Northwestern University. I was called into the meeting on Thursday. The panel members were seated around this table. It was a rather somber and impressive occasion, actually. I was a junior member, and I remember feeling considerably nervous and apprehensive about being in front of this powerhouse of scientists. But then for the past four years, I had been scientific advisor to the US Air Force on this very problem. There were two films that were, were of particular interest to the panel at that time. One was a film taken by a Navy officer while on vacation in Utah, near Tremont in Utah. And the other was a film taken in Great Falls, Montana, by the owner of the local baseball team. The Utah film had already been subjected to some thousand or so man hours of analysis by the Navy's Photographic Interpretation Laboratory. So the panel uh, got up in their chairs and crouched around the wall to examine the films, and they asked to have the films run several times, as a matter of fact. Now, the Navy had, on the basis of their detailed analysis of the Utah films, they had concluded that the objects shown in the films could not be birds, balloons, aircraft, and so forth, but indeed that they were self-luminous, unidentified objects. Despite this conclusion, the panel rejected it and concluded that the objects were birds. They couldn't be unidentified, therefore they had to be birds. I came away from the meeting and from the room with the distinct feeling, however, that the panel had deliberately moved to debunk the whole subject and not to give it the serious scientific attention which it deserved. It seems the CIA was to become involved in the UFO phenomena again in a most unusual way. A series of episodes were to take place that up until the airing of this program were not public knowledge. The events were so bizarre that it's hard to conceive they happened to individuals associated with such no-nonsense organizations as the Office of Naval Intelligence and the CIA. This man is retired Lieutenant Colonel Robert Friend, U.S. Air Force, and former head of Project Blue Book. Friend, now on the management staff of Celesco Industries Incorporated, which builds and launches missiles for defense testing purposes. Friend now relates this most unusual experience. 
1959 when I was invited to attend a briefing in the security portion of this building. It seemed that a retired rear admiral had infamously